Hey, this is Benjamin Boyce. Welcome to my YouTube channel. And today I have a discussion for you with Nina Paley, who is a director of animated romps through visual and mythological vistas. She directed or produced and created Sita Sings the Blues and recently Cedar Masochism, which is about the Abrahamic traditions. And her latest film, Cedar Masochism, is being roundly blacklisted at the hands of trans activists who perceive her as being transphobic because she holds to what she calls a fact that penises are male appendages, not female appendages, and that women are adult female humans. In this discussion, we talk about why those facts are now opinions and the problems with censorship when it is handed over to people who are of a very uh, strong authoritarian ideological bent. Be sure to check out her films, which are widely available online for free at the various websites that I'm going to link down below in the description. Here is Nina Paley. Okay, thanks for doing this. Thanks for doing it on short notice. Yeah. It's like crisis here. Is it? Well, it's, I mean, all right, so it's, I have to remind myself that it's not everyone here. It's just some people here, and it takes a small number of people to cause a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, yeah, I think, I think when people are being blacklisted and uh, lied about and targeted hmm. by people, I mean me, <laughs> um, that's that's a crisis. I mean, I'm scared to go to the food co-op. I'm hmm. uh, my my film has been uh, deplatformed once and blacklisted again and possibly another time. And um, this film has nothing to do with trans issues, but because I said in public on social media that penises are male and women don't have penises, mm -hmm. then I'm banned from the local theater. Well, in what context did you say that? Uh, on Facebook uh, two years ago, and it was because this woman in Canada had gone to a women's march and held up a sign that says biology is not hate or something like that. And she was saying, you know, trans people are not the you know, trans males, males that identify as trans are not literally women mm -hmm. is what she had on this sign. And as a consequence of this, she was targeted by a Canadian politician named Morgane Ogre <laughs> or Ogier. O Ogier, yeah. Ogier, yeah. Yeah. And and hunted, like hunted on social media. Like, you know, our picture was everywhere. It was like, you know, enemy of the people. And I thought this was insane. Like, it's a woman's march. There's a woman at a woman's march hmm. talking about biology. And really, not a hateful sign. But the fact that she was so targeted afterwards, I was like, um, you know, expressing some solidarity with this woman. So I shared the song. If a person has a penis, he's a man, and that's just outraged people. Hmm. And uh, ever since, that is what is dragged out as an example of how Nina Paley hates trans people. And that was two years ago. Yeah, it was like a year and a half or two years ago. Okay, so that's probably at the kind of the beginning of the emergence of this type of trans activism. That's probably... oh, it's been going on longer than that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's been going on. Actually, okay, so the song, the song, bleh. I know I officially, like, came out on Facebook as critical of this stuff a little over two years ago in March. Actually, I shared the song, it was probably more like a year ago. I'm not sure exactly when it was. Okay. Um, yeah, it was maybe a year, a little more than a year ago. Uh, but the, the trans stuff has been, I've been aware of it for three or four years. Um, and what people... Well, I don't know if they know about this this about me or not, but what they what they assume about me is that I've never met a trans person, that I don't know anything about trans people. And, you know, I lived in the Castro in San Francisco all throughout the 90s. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of trans friends and have trans friends. 
uh, be they transsexuals or transgender identified. I have been hanging out with trans people since before these activists were born. And uh, so, you know, trans people, trans has been a thing for a long time, but, but the activists changed. I noticed it like four or five years ago, it started to change. Mm -hmm. Other women tell me it changed about 10 years ago. Something really changed. Yeah. Where and it's, it's been very up. reactionary or very authoritarian or going after people, openly going after people who disagree with a certain line. Yes, and it's, be it's become super attractive to heterosexual white men. Like, I think, I think that's one of the big differences. Two, a couple things happen. One is that heterosexual white men realize that they could be, you know, the champions of the poor, oppressed other heterosexual white men. And hmm. uh, also this, um, it, it became the thing for girls in high schools. So once upon a time, uh, men, you know, trans people were very much more dominated by men than women or males than females. And in the last, I don't know, starting maybe five years ago, all of a sudden there was, there was this explosion of teenage girls identifying as trans. Mm -hmm and uh, getting mastectomies and hormone treatments and Lupron and things like that by supposedly they're very well-meaning liberal parents or conservative parents or parents that didn't want a gay daughter and would prefer hmm. to have a trans son. Um, and yeah, so that's been happening too. And I mean, what's, really, your uh, what's your perspective? What's your viewpoint? Uh, looking at this, where are you looking at this from? What's your critique or your? your... Oh well, my critique is of gender. I, okay. you know, I'm female. I had to endure a lot of bullshit growing up because I was female. It had nothing to do with my identity. It was hmm. because I was female. Like, um, there's there's so much about you know, the nightmare of growing up female and the expectations of you and the fact that like there was a, a super eight camera in the junior high school and they loaned it to boys, but they didn't loan it to me. You know, and I said, okay. I wanted to use the super eight camera. I was the, you know, the guy, the adult in charge of it just laughed at me. Hmm. Things like that, you know, a whole okay. life of things like that. And, um, sexist stereotypes, have they've been a real source of pain and difficulty and uh, hmm. you know people people boil everything down to money right so I'll say career harm you know monetary okay. harm these sexist stereotypes yeah. they've affected every aspect of my life so so to have this movement that is based in sexist stereotypes and and is um, saying that no women are not that, that whether you're female, that's irrelevant. It's like your stereotypes. It's like this, this, you know, oh, I feel like a woman. I'm so feminine. I feel feminine. And it's just a big pile of stereotypes hmm. that I criticize other. Um, and by the way, I'm so wary of using the word feminist because that word is so meaningless. Okay. I don't know really what word to use. Um, also because uh, if you start saying feminist, that's just another identity on the identity pile. Like, oh, okay. such and so identifies as a fan. But well, you can you know, specify say, it. Know. What do you mean by feminism then? Well, I don't really, I, I mean, uh, what I'm talking about for myself is I'm just going to say I use radical feminist analysis, right? Okay. That doesn't mean I identify as a feminist. It just means that radical feminists have been writing critiques of gender for a long time. And in terms of people that have thought it out very clearly, I would say that radical feminist critique is one that I share. Okay. And what's the core of that that um, is useful for you in, you know, I guess, organizing experience? Uh, core of radical. Well, um, it certainly it certainly bypasses identity and identity politics. I mean, things that happened to me. No one was discriminating against me because of my identity, right? Like. Now, thing, you know, my, my career as a cartoonist wasn't hindered because of my identity. It's because I'm female. Okay. 
it's it's because um, how other people identified you then. Yes, and you know, and and accurately, right? Because I actually am female. Okay. Right, like it's. <laughs> It's yeah. true. <laughs> okay, so there's you being a female, and then there's a bunch of baggage that the people that you interacted with would put upon you because you're Correct. female that you disagree with. Correct. And that you're seeing as being used within the radical trans activist lobby to reverse power structures or re reassemble different forms of power structures that then go back and oppress females. Well, the thing is, they're not re they're not doing anything with power structures. They're reifying the power structures that I abhor. Okay. They're like, they're they're regressive. Like they're they're putting miracle grow on all the stereotypes hmm. that uh, you know I and other women despise. Yeah. Right. And, like and like your yeah. despisal of these stereotypes comes from you being denied access to services, you being discriminated against, you being uh, put down and looked down upon in your, let's say, lived experience and in, in your, in your life. Yeah. And I mean, like just noticing things like in school, right. You know, I'd say a joke in class, nothing would happen. A minute later, a boy hmm. would say the exact same thing, right. Whole class is like, ah, ha, ha, hmm. and uproarious. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, in conversations, you know, like, um, uh, speaking my mind, um, not okay. Right. Like it's not okay for me to say things socially that are okay mm. for men to say, like, like the way groups, both men and women respond mm. to certain kinds of behaviors. There's, there's a ton of behaviors, even though I'm considered a particularly, you know, aggressive or assertive female, mm. there's a whole bunch that I don't do, uh, like compulsively and habitually because it does not go over well. Okay. If yeah. I, if I say things that, um, men can say just fine. For example, if I say penises are male, a whole Twitter, not the whole Twitter, but you know, Twitter mobs are going to target me. Um, and men that do that, it takes, it takes a lot more work for a man to get banned mm. from Twitter or targeted by a Twitter mob for mm. saying penises are male or women don't have penises. It seems like within the context strictly of Twitter of you saying that and getting that sort of reaction, it's that it seems like you saying that is a threat. Whereas if somebody like I say that or mock that, which I have online and I don't really get much uh, pushback so far. Um, but I, again, I, I probably not that big of a, not big of a threat, but what is it about you saying that that is threatening? Do you, do you suppose? Yeah. Okay. So, um, it is going way out of bounds of the stereotypes and expectations for women. Hmm. Women are supposed to, um, approve of and validate men. That's what we're trained to do. Hmm. So when a man or when men, when a group of men, when a movement of men that says they're women, does not get validation from a woman, boy, are they pissed off. Hmm. It's like they think they think women are their mom. Hmm. You know, like you're like when dudes don't do it, it's like whatever. Like it's not it's not men's job to validate and coddle insecure men. It's hmm. women's job to do that. So when women refuse to do that, they go into narcissistic rage. Hmm. That's and, my understanding of it. I mean, we're also yeah. we're supposed to do that for everyone, right? Like women are supposed to be like the super nice. And if you see the the dynamics of trans identified males and uh, what we call liberal feminists, okay. they're all like, yeah, you know, yes, queen. Like, oh yeah, you're so beautiful. Oh yeah, I love you. You know, come to my bathroom. Like, like this <laughs> bending over backwards for. Uh, you know, approval and celebration and things like that. Maybe and even women, bending over forwards if I can go or, there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just bending over, basically. <laughs> um, and then women that don't do that, we are really enraging in ways that men aren't. Hmm. Because we're the source of approval and validation for them. That's our job. And so how do... It seems like I don't really 
fully understand your story. I don't really know your entire story. You sent me an email chain where somebody shared your movie with a group of people. Somebody came out and said that you are a transphobe and then proceeded this kind of back and forth about what it is to be a transphobe and why somebody saying that you're a transphobe makes it automatically valid because you're not supposed to question anybody who's oppressed or who claims oppression. You don't question that, even if they're wrong. It said that in the email. Even if they're wrong, you don't tell them that you're wrong because that's invalidating that. So that seems like just kind of the tip of the iceberg with regards to the kind of blowback that you're experiencing for stating a position. Yeah. But it's going, you're, you're kind of seems to say that, that now you've been confronted in person where you go out and in public. Is that what's happening to you now? Or? Right. Hang on. Um, uh, I stay in a lot, but I am trying to, I've been trying to have a screening of my movie in this town. And um, what, what this group of people did, the first screening that was scheduled, they just went online and said, this person's a horrible transphobe. Um, don't show her work. And the venue just immediately caved. Mm -hmm. And I, when that happened, which was in July, I think, I was like, this is really bad. Like that, that venue should not have done that because when people act that way and then you give them what they want, that's like, they get so empowered by that. You know, mm -hmm. they, it's like yeah. they get the taste for human blood <laughs> and then they want more. Yeah. And, and sure enough, um, it's, <laughs> you know, like the, the accusations against me just keep escalating. Well, I, I guess the, the question is what I'm trying to get at is how do you move forward? What, what options oh, are right. there are people for you? Building bridges? Well, well, one woman sort of in that, you know, social justice community did email me this week and said, uh, so I'm trying to understand you say woman means adult human female, yet you claim you're not transphobic. How can this be? And I wrote back to her and said, let's get together and talk. Because she actually said in this email, like, if this would be better as a phone call or coffee, let's do it. And I wrote back and was like, great, let's do it. Let's talk. Haven't heard anything okay. from her. I, I, don't, I don't really know what her motivation was, but it was like, I was like, hello, I'm here. Let's talk. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, another, another person, the, um, the Evergreen graduate, sent me an email saying like, I'm just letting you know that I'm, I'm going to be speaking out about your transphobia. This is beyond the pale. You need to apologize. Um, if you apologize, you can heal. The, the community can heal. You can heal. Okay. Apologize for having the opinion that a female is somebody without a penis or a female is somebody who's born female. That fe female is an adult human adult female human. Yes. And it's, it's interesting that that is now an opinion, but that's now like, you know, it's yeah. like, it's actually a fact. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's like, okay, you know, we can downgrade it to opinion if you want. <laughs> um, I mean, actually, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to downgrade it to opinion. Um, and, and why, why does that need to remain in place? What, what's at stake in, in putting yourself on that hill? Right. Uh, a lot of it is um, trying to resist a descent into total Orwellianism. Like, like when woman means adult human female, or that even female and male exist, right? Because the current trend is to say, oh, you know, no one even knows what the difference is mm. between male and female. Uh, mm. You know, they, they make it seem really sciencey, right? Like they, yeah. they it's the, the it's New York the Times just denial. came out with a piece like that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the science denial of the left. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so some of it is just this assault on reality, hmm. which is uh, an aspect of authoritarianism that I just, I just hmm. am saying no to it. Like I, I'm not going to just sit here while hmm. this is happening. I can't bear to do that. And if 
stating statements uh, gets you such backlash and hate. Mm -hmm. What do you think about art? What's the role of art? Have you thought about uh, recasting the statement in a way that that uses your medium of of cartoon and film? Is is that in your mind? Is that yeah? Well, possibility. I've been doing a lot of reflecting and evaluating uh, my art, my movies, the main way I have distributed my stuff is on the internet. I free my work and people share it with each other. And 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that was incredible. The internet was a different place. Hmm. Um, it has changed a lot. Now the internet most of the discourse that occurs on the internet happens in social media and these political phenomena such as rabid uh, Hmm. sort of men's rights trans activists are a product of social media. And when I think about making more art or engaging with this more online, On the one hand, yes, people need to discuss this. On the other hand, behavior has become so toxic. Like, I really think people are addicted to social media and the internet in ways that, like, we're not prepared for. Hmm. And that a a lot of this is just a consequence of social media. And so I'm, I'm reluctant to make more art that is shared on these platforms. And I'm, I mean, hopefully, well, not hopefully, possibly I will resolve how I approach all this. My inclination recently has been to really step back from social media and examine the way it's affecting me. Okay. And because it, you know, it's it's not like if it's tweaking out other people, it's magically not tweaking out me. I mean, I know that I, I hmm. am addicted to it and have to stop. And the, the anxieties that came up with stopping using Facebook were pretty intense. And I'm, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty, like, relatively sane for an internet addict. And I was like, if this is, if this is this hard for me, right? Like if this feels like death for me, Hmm. it's probably going to be like a lot more intense for a lot other of other people. Well, what's dying then? Oh, the, the false self I have, right? Like the, the online self. I mean, you, you have this online presence. That's not actually you. It's, it's a disembodied presence. That was actually the great promise of the internet, right? On the internet, no one knows you're a dog. On the internet, yeah. no one knows you're a man or a woman. And that's fine. It's actually great. I mean, that, that aspect of it is really liberating. A consequence of it, though, is that people are totally alienated from physical reality to the point where they don't think like... I mean, to the point where biological sex they think doesn't exist, right? Because if you grow up or if you, even if you just spend the last 10 years having your, uh, your identity be something that you create through writing and pictures, yeah. um, then of course, like, you know, being male or female is a, is a matter of identity, right? Like that is the reality on the internet. Yeah, yeah. It uh, seems fascinating, though, that biological reality keeps seeping back into our expressions of ourselves on the internet, where algorithms can tell if you're a male or a female based on your patterns of communication at this point. It's still, in biological reality still informing our behavior, but it seems like there's this uh, kind of this patina or this, this veil that exists where we can plausibly deny it to a certain degree Mm -hmm. or even force other people to plausibly deny it or get shoved off the platform. Right. 
Uh, that's interesting. I'd like to know more about um, the algorithms that determine whether you're male or female, uh, because uh, I assume that if these are working, then they are accurately determining maleness or femaleness regardless of gender identity. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's uh, right now. I don't know much about that. That's from another uh, discussion that I had with a trans person who was identified with their uh, by the algorithm with their biological sex. Well, sex. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I can certainly believe that. Like I know that I know that within um, trans communities, uh, trans identified females get talked over by trans identified males. In other words, That's trans the men. Anecdotal. Yeah. Yeah. Talk over. Yes. And then also in, in terms of media coverage, if you, if you see like news stories about trans women versus trans men, trans women who are male are celebrated for their achievements in tech or their firefighters or their pilots. And they do really hmm. cool things. And trans women have, or trans men get news coverage when they have babies. Hmm. When they get pregnant. Uh, when they fulfill the biological role of their biological sex. Well, it's just, it's like, yeah, great. It's like more, wow, we have news stories about men doing cool things and women having babies. Hmm. Interesting. Like, that's really fresh. Hmm. <laughs> that's Interesting, really yeah. overthrowing the patriarchy. Hmm. Well, if the, the problem with being against a movement is that it kind of leads you into just constantly being on the attack or on the, the offensive. So the question that I want to propose and wait, investigate wait, before you ask is, that question, I, it's like, I, I'm not, it's like when you say against a movement, yeah. what do you mean? Well, that's the question. Maybe I'm framing it wrong, but what are you for rather than, than defining mm -hmm. you in relationship against the trans community? What should we define you for? What, what are you trying to stand for? Right. Well, first, I don't, we're not talking about the trans community. We're talking about trans activists. Okay. Trans activists increasingly do not represent the trans community. I agree. I mean, a lot of transsexuals are, are not welcome in yeah. what are called trans communities. Mm -hmm. um, so I say, you know, I like, I distinguish trans activists from trans people. I agree. Right? Like in this you. town, Thank you. The, the trans activists are, you know, they're mostly, they're almost entirely uh, strong, healthy, young, white, heterosexual men. Um, those are the people speaking, <laughs> speaking for the trans, you know, being the champions of trans. Uh, but right, what do I stand for in, in regards to trans issues? Well, I, in, what is causing the friction and, and can we define that in positive terms? Oh, like, what is it within that phrase? I guess we can just continue to unpack the phrase. Uh, a woman is adult human female. Uh, mm -hmm. A penis is a male appendage. Yeah. Penis is male. Yeah. Women don't have penises. Uh, right. So. What is that really saying? What And in, in saying that, what can we build on top of that? Why is that so important to keep in place? Why is that a functioning part of reality? That's right. Uh, because it, it is at the very, well, it's not unlike Winston Smith saying two plus two equals four, right? Like in the book, 1984, okay. that was, that was what he clung to. Like, as long as I can think this, then I still have some autonomy. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Uh, woman means adult human female is like at a, at a very basic level describing reality. It is a grounded, it is statement of fact grounded in reality. So it's a, it's like an alignment with observable reality. And then, of course, everyone says, like, oh, but, you know, 0. 0.000, you know, 2% of, yeah. you know, people have ambiguous genitalia. And it's like, that doesn't actually change this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, so when, when you make that statement, then it leads to the question, but, well, what is, what is woman? And then what is the feminine? And how do you navigate that? And what are the burdens that you've had to bear because of that? And what are, I guess, some of the uh, privileges that that gives you, or at least uh, protections that that gives you? 
Right. Well, I think that, you know, gender is not the same as sex. Okay. Gender is sex roles. They are roles assigned to people uh, based on their sex. And they're annoying roles. They're, they're <laughs> confining. You know, a positive expression of what I would like is for anyone to perform any roles that they like. Everyone should be free to perform, you know, wear anything that they like, dress any way they like, wear makeup, don't wear makeup, uh, wear heels, don't wear heels. That's great. I actually am like super in favor of not conforming to gender. Okay. Um, which is but not one pronouns. of the reasons. What? But not pronouns. Uh, Aren't pronouns just a social dressing? Like, like a pronoun? Like if, if I can choose to wear a dress, can't mm -hmm. I choose to be called a she? Well, you can choose any pronouns you want. I mean, you can totally say, like, you can also identify however you want, right? Like, this is okay. a weird thing about this. Like, hmm. like, people seem to think that I'm telling them how they can identify, and I'm not. It's like you, you know, you identify however you want. But just, you can't force everyone else to identify you the same way. Hmm. It's, it's like religion, right? Like, believe in God, you know? Believe in any God or gods that you want. I'm fine with that. Like, okay. that's, that's religious freedom. But you still want to separate the sexes in the, uh, let's say, a concrete example of the bathroom. You're, mm -hmm. you're okay with a man dressing as a woman... Uh, thinking of themselves as a woman, but not using the facilities of women. Yeah, Is I mean, there a bathroom, line there? bathrooms are a bit of a red herring. I'd rather talk about prisons and rape shelters. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, because that, those are higher stakes. Okay, okay. Uh, but yes, um, uh, sure, yeah, identify however you want, but um, keep prisons segregated by sex. And also rape and domestic violence shelters for women need to be segregated by sex. Uh, I mean, but is that, there's just, there's something kind of confusing or slippery about uh, the gender is a social construct argument, because it seems like to me, somebody could just run with that and then start demanding that they have access to every woman's space because they identify with right. a woman. And right. how do you draw that line if you, where's that magic line where gender no longer is a construct? It, it is based on not identity, but on biology. Oh, okay. You're conflating the words gender and sex. Well, I, I think I, that I, once they just, become decoupled, it eventually, I just see that it eventually goes into, if there's no basis in sex for gender, then there shouldn't be any basis of discrimination at all based on sex because it's all gender, right? What? <laughs> okay. I don't understand that. Okay. I mean, sex, sex is biological fact, right? Yeah. Like sex, sex is what you observe. Gender is, is roles, expectations, restrictions. Gender is the, are, is sex roles or sex stereotypes. Yeah. But it's based on sex. It's, 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 applied to you based on what sex you are. Yes. Like, okay. like you're born female and people start giving you pink stuff and talking to you a certain way and, um, okay. getting a lot angrier at you if you, uh, fight physically. Huh. Uh, and if you're born male, then they give you blue stuff. And if you're, you know, rough with the other boys, they're like, Oh, rough and tumble. That's a rough and hmm. tumble boy. You know, like they don't, they don't, chastise the boy for how mean he's being hmm. the same way that they do for girls people. Okay. So, so, so you, but uh, you want that, you want the, uh, the, the application of roles onto sex to be lifted up except in certain circumstances. Yeah. I mean, prisons. yes, it's like, it's like people can have any sort of personality regardless hmm. of what sex they are. You can, you can have different personality, different tastes, different, you know, clothing styles. Uh, hmm. mm -hmm. that's, that's just a personality. And it's, you, I don't, I don't think that should be like, uh, reinforced or approved for one person because they're a particular sex and, hmm. you know, punished in another person because they're a particular sex. 
uh, the the reason. <sighs> I mean, so I guess so. So then is are what you getting at is oh well if it if it weren't for gender if we didn't have gender then we wouldn't need to segregate facilities by sex because there would be no. Um, like there wouldn't be violence against women if there were no gender because no okay I'm 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 I think my position is is that what we call gender while it is applied to people based on their sex it's still applied to people based on their sex because in general the sexes give rise to different behaviors, which lead to different expectations, which those expectations are then modeled on a cultural level. And once you say that all of it is arbitrary and not based on sex, then you get the next thought is, well, I can choose my sex because I can choose my gender. My gender. I see what you're saying. Okay. So one when your pattern is still going to be enforced, your, your biology is still enforcing your roles. It's still going to pre, uh, generally, uh, inform a man to act in a certain behavioral system that will give rise to firefighters and criminals. Right. And in, in a certain way, in a certain outward going way. Right. I mean, this, this is a really complex yeah. question. But certainly the way we, I mean, women are on the whole, not as strong as men. Right. Like that's a that's a biological fact yeah. about women on the whole. I mean, there are, of course, some women that are stronger than some men. But overall, women are not as strong as men. That absolutely affects um, behavior. Right. Like, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons that women are they're both encouraged to and also rationally choose a lot of submissive behaviors because mm -hmm. in a fight, um, we're not going to win in a physical fight. Right. So, yeah, in a physical so fight, yeah. you know, animals going to surrender, like the weaker animal surrenders, um, or, you know, exposes its belly or whatever. Uh, and yes, that is then socially ingrained. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, these, yeah, these aspects of these things are related yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm not I'm not denying that, but there's okay. but there is a lot of stuff that is arbitrary, like the colors pink and blue. Yes. It, yeah. I mean those those switched over times. High heels, those are arbitrary. Um, yeah. uh, makeup, those. makeup is also arbitrary, right? I mean it's it's switched a hmm. lot. So, um, but submission, I think. Hmm is much more related to sex. And so we have, you know, culturally specific symbols of submission. The <laughs> radical feminist line is um, femininity is ritualized submission. Hmm. So regardless of what these arbitrary things are, they are associated with uh, submission and femininity, which is associated with being female. So right? what is it spark, like spark to be a, a non-submissive female then? What is it? What? What is it like to be a non-submissive? To to be a female that says, "I will not submit." Oh that... well, you get basically get burned as a witch. Hmm. I mean, people hate you. They just and they just escalate their accusations against you. I mean, that's what's happened here. It's like it started with, "Oh, she's an awful transphobe." Shut down the movie, and uh, you know, then we tried to rent the art theater. And, you know, oh, she's a transphobe, shut down the movie. And now we've got the Virginia theater and the, the accusations are stunning. Hmm. Like now I'm a white, uh, white a, a right wing white supremacist eugenicist that wants to kill trans people. Yeah. The eugenicist part is confusing. What, what do they mean by that? I, I read that in that email chain, like you, you want to rebreed the people or snuff out them from breeding or something <laughs> search me hmm. well, apparently though i mean <laughs> you'll have to ask them really yeah 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 uh but yes this is what happens um you get like absolutely pilloried you get singled out uh you get lied about and you get targeted by a mob i mean it's it's like this really primitive hmm. mob behavior hmm. you're and very witch hunty for sure. It's super witch hunty, yeah. Huh. 
How do you defend yourself against that? Or in what way can we diminish that behavior and, and I guess, take the teeth out of it or, let's say, castrate that kind of rabid uh, targeting? I don't think we can. I think when this has happened in the past, I think it's just terrible. Hmm. And, I mean, I, I've stated, I've written a, a lot of essays about this stuff which is available for anybody to read. I state things very clearly and hmm. it makes no difference. Absolutely no difference. I mean, they're saying that I want, they were like really angry about this panel that I did and Corinna was right there on the panel. Right. Hmm. So you'd think if I want to genocide trans people, like Corinna would be dead by now. Right. Well, like, yeah. Think Corinna and I wouldn't be friends. Well, Corinna's got internalized transphobia, right? That's the explanation for Corinna. <laughs> and I've had her on my channel. I've also had Carrie Callahan on my channel. Okay. Yeah. I've spoken to both of those people. I actually watched that panel of uh, uh, you guys. Yeah. So I just, and in my, I, I've been looking at this and speaking with a variety of people on this. Uh, unfortunately, I've yet to speak with a, somebody who takes a radical activist position in the trans uh, discussion or whatever it is. But I, I see that the only way forward is to bring forth that which is rational rather than to simply decry the irrational. Decrying the irrational just makes it even more irate and irrational or irrational. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the moving forward in a patient, uh, reasonable way with the explanation of why these definitions matter, why reality needs to, has this form and why we need to recognize this form and why is that important in the long term, even if it marginalizes certain people and their uh, beliefs or behaviors. That's kind of what I've seen as the way forward. Have you had luck with that? I, 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 I guess, I, again, again, I'm just, I, I'm probably not important enough to piss off that many people. So I've only just had collections of, of really great discussions with a number of trans people and detrans people and, and doctors and scientists and researchers and psychologists, um, just to try to give more depth into this discussion for reasonable people to find that they can engage with this material and they don't just blow it off. I think that one of the strengths of being a crazy activist is that you scare a lot of people and you just, a lot of people just just tune you out. Like I, I, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. That doesn't affect me until it does. And so if we can give people who would kind of see that this does affect you or will affect somebody that, you know, eventually, then if we give them, uh, the, the tools to understand what it is to be trans, because even that concept is still pretty out there for most people. They don't really understand what that is all about. Like, why would you want to change your sex? What does that even mean? Um, then once we start to understand that it is a phenomena and, and there's certain different actually layers of the phenomena and not all people who are declaring themselves as trans, either one are activists or two uh, display the behaviors of the activists. Right. I can say that the, from from what I can see, the most the most active of activists in my town, who are the most aggressive at shutting me down and who are also lying about me the most, are like I said, heterosexual white men. Mm -hmm. And I'm pondering why this is so attractive right now to them. Mm -hmm. um, why do you and, think? Hmm? Why do you think? It is attractive. Uh, I think <laughs> um, I think white guilt is a is a real phenomenon. Have you ever read this essay by Shelby Steele, The Age of White Guilt and the Disappearance of the Black Individual? No. That is a great essay. And he wrote it 20 years ago. Okay. And uh, it actually has a lot to do with 
um, the current social justice warrior movement and also events at Evergreen. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, white, white guilt is a real thing and male guilt is a real thing. Hmm. And uh, right and left <coughs> have different approaches for dealing with it, but they're, they're really kind of doing the They sort of have the same, I think white men have the same problem, whether they're right or left. And I think a lot of far right white men deal with it by being, you know, getting into men's rights and uh, also some white supremacy for sure. Hmm. Uh, and on the left, they deal with it by declaring non-binary identities or, or trying to attach themselves to some kind of victimized identity that they, they really hate <coughs> being in what's called an oppressor class. Hmm. And they want to identify out of that. So I, I think the pressure of that and the burden of that is like hmm. more than white men can handle anymore. Do you and, think that that framework of identities being oppressors rather than individuals being oppressors kind of leads individuals into claiming identities that shield them from, isn't it the framework of looking at the world as a mass of identities that are oppressing each other and that there's a stack. Doesn't that incentivize somebody to figure out how they can get down from that perch? Sure. And sure. On the left. Yes. On the left where that's valued, right? On the left where guilt, <laughs> Guilt reigns supreme, and and that's the way of dealing okay. with guilt. But it, like I say, on the right, it's it's the other thing. It's like you know, fuck yeah, I'm on top, and fuck you, I'm here for hmm. a reason. Okay. And on on the left, it's like I'm not on top. I'm super oppressed. I'm a victim. Hmm. Help, help. But so, what's the root of guilt then? What are these people running away from that they could be dealing with in a better way? Well, I mean, there is this legacy of slavery in the United States. I mean, that's that's like a national guilt that is is well addressed in Shelby Steele's essay, The Age of White Guilt. Hmm. Um, it, but, you know, people people do not deal with it in a healthy or productive way. Well, how I do think. you deal with something that you didn't do yourself that you just inherited? all this? Right. You you deal with it rationally. Right. Like you you address it, you acknowledge it, hmm. you and, you know, and then you you move forward with some awareness. Hmm. Um, hmm. Shelby Steele, really, it's a, it's a must read. I'll, I'll read that. It's, What's the name of it again? The Age of it's White called, It's guilt? called The Age of White Guilt and the Disappearance of the Black Individual. Okay. okay. Right? So people are not dealing with it consciously or, or healthily the way, the way white academia has dealt with it, according to Steele, and I would agree, is they've gone from condemning black people because of their skin to uh, exalting and needing black people because of their skin for the moral authority that only black people can give white people. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I find that whole thing wrongheaded, but I mean, the whole, the first move and the second move are both Mm -hmm. wrong. Yes, so does Shelby Steele. <laughs> okay. Well, what's so the what's the people. solution then? Is it a return to let's say uh, this is another word that you're not supposed to say because you have to define it every single time you say it? But uh, a liberal uh, individual responsibility rubric is that the way forward, or is there another way forward? Um, well, I mean, certainly Steele uh, is in favor of yes, the individual. I mean, the freedom of the individual, right? Particularly, you know, black individuals who hmm. do not get treated as individuals because their skin color is so desired by white people, especially hmm. in academia, so that like whatever else they're saying uh, pales, so to speak, in comparison to their value as as tokens, basically, hmm. that lend legitimacy to white institutions. Hmm. Um, hmm. Uh, but where I'm getting off track there. Um, okay. Uh, let, I mean, I mean it's, in individuals, like, yes, I mean, I, I try to deal with all this by, um, uh, 
looking at individuals. Yes, I try to do that. That doesn't mean that classes go away. That doesn't okay. mean that class dynamics don't exist. It doesn't mean that institutions, you know, it doesn't mean that things don't occur on an institutional level. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that I hmm. do pursue individualism as the way forward is it's all I've got. Hmm. I mean, all I have is like my own individual life, right? Like class organizing doesn't, doesn't work very well and is kind of a failure in this country. Hmm. And when I do see people attempting to organize, you know, or, or, to claim that they're organizing as classes, what I'm seeing is just this power grab hmm. by narcissistic individuals, you know, claiming to speak for marginalized groups, but all, it, I mean, it just seems that they're enhancing their own power through this. Hmm. And, and so to me that it appears to be a failure in this country hmm. to, to do that because the narcissists always come in and, uh, exploit that. Well, I'm not happy about that. I mean, yeah. I mean, ideally there would be some class organization hmm. that was functional. It's just not happening. And so it's like, well, I got my own individual self. I have my own individual voice. Um, I know that if I speak up as an individual that does make other individuals think a little bit sometimes hmm. and maybe okay. feel a little more courage. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask. If you are, if you, if you're left with only embracing your individual experience and standing on your own two feet, then when the mob comes after you, like, who do you have to help you? Like, that's the one weakness of being an individual, unless you're in a society of in individuals who band together right. for certain, to right. for certain things. Right. And the mobs come after me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like really weird thing. Like, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I do want people to know about this, right? That's why I was like, hey, you know, yeah. can we talk? So uh, you are going to be showing your film on the 8th, you said? or the Yes, 7th? Wednesday, okay. May 8th, 7 p.m. at the Virginia Theater in Champaign, Illinois. Please come. Anybody who's anywhere near this, please come. And what's the movie? It's Cedar Masochism? The movie, the movie is Seder Masochism. Seder. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, an animated musical ostensibly about Passover. Uh, the, the screening is sponsored by Just Foreign Policy, uh, which is showing it because it's also an anti-war film. Hmm. And what's the, it's, what's it about? It's about the Passover and the Passover exodus. Okay. Hmm. Uh, the, the origins of Abrahamism. Yeah. Okay. The, the end of, uh, goddess worship. Yeah, yeah, the the found the seed of patriarchy. Then. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which patriarchy. I guess in in a way, I mean the patriarchs speaking biblically, the patriarchs yes. begin with Adam. I guess they begin with Adam and then uh, eventually get to Abraham, but in a way this does is related to uh the slander you're receiving, but not really. I mean it's about uh, Jewish stories and a Jewish tradition and you're being slandered not for anything having to do with Judaism, but with these other statements or this other stance. Right. But also it's not a Jewish story. It's an Abrahamic story. So it's, okay. it's also Christian okay. and Muslim. Yeah. I mean, that right. was my reason for choosing the Exodus story. The fact that I was raised with, pa with Passover was like my, my entry into it. Uh, but it's, it's foundational to Christianity and Islam as well. Yeah. And so there's some tablets involved and people smashing them or is, uh -huh. there, a, yep. is, is there a golden calf in this story? Uh-huh. We got, we got all of that. All your, all the greatest hits. <laughs> <laughs> we got wandering in the desert. We got crossing the Red Sea. We got death of the firstborn Egyptians. Hmm. Whoa. Yep. So w what are you going to be doing going forward then? I, I, with regards to the issue that you're facing now, uh, speaking out, writing, making mm -hmm. connections. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm writing a lot. I'm writing on paper because, uh, I'm, you know, with taking a step back from social media and internet and my own screen addiction, 
writing on paper was a Mm. good alternative to that. I really think differently when I write on paper. Um, I've also been reading on paper, reading Mm. books, long form stuff, pondering Mm. nuance and, and, you know, my whole, my whole life as an artist has been making things really short and concise and digestible really meme oriented. And now I'm like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. So your question about how do you defend yourself? People are giving me all this advice, you know, like, Oh, you have to make really short statements about what you really believe. And I have done that, right? Like one of my, I thought this was an excellent, excellent formulation of what I think. I respect your humanity, not your identity. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Right. It's short. Um, It infuriates identitarians. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's also true. Like I really do respect everyone's Mm. humanity, but I don't respect any identity. I don't respect my own identities. Mm. I'm really wary of identity. Uh, Speaking of another little line I have, identity is the commodified self. Mm. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's like a packaging. And this is why (laughs) when you go off social media, it feels like a death because Mm. you, we have these ways of, of packaging ourselves Mm. Uh, in such ways that they are they are exchangeable with other people, or marketable, or comprehensible, yeah. and we sort of go on a, on an information market with this, and that's what mm. identity is. Um, it's it's very shallow. Yeah, there's there's much more to us than our identities. Yeah, it's the stand-in for the soul in the information age. <laughs> yeah, and it's <laughs> and it's not very satisfying. Yeah. Well, especially as an artist, um, being somebody who I guess needs to participate in form and function and, and the aesthetic and, and the visualization and, and the, the representative, like it, it needs to be changing for it to be alive. It needs to be in conflict or it has some, has to have some sort of dynamism for it to hold reality thinking artistically. Like, <laughs> well, I guess it's a question I, I'm thinking just to myself and like how I don't like having a, a picture, a, a, a profile picture. Like I have to have one, but uh, is that me? Is that, that thing there, that's me. That's what other people see. Like that's the little dollop of Benjamin. Like, no, that doesn't. And how do I, I, so I feel like I have to constantly upgrade it in order to keep it alive or keep it fresh or mm. not be a container or an idol or something that's locked mm. in place. Right. Yeah. Actually, the word identity is is related to the word idol. Is it? Yeah. Hmm. And there's also this great word, I, ideolatry. That's right. So we know about idolatry, but ideolatry, which is the worship of the self. It's a, it's, <laughs> I thought it's the worship of the idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, the self you know. is... Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of funny because when I, when I made Seder Masochism, I was very much... Uh, I was not jiving with the Old Testament stories. I was like, this, it, it felt really, it felt like the desert to me, you know? Like when I made my first film, Sita Sings the Blues, and was, was working with Hindu mythology, I loved it. I took to it like a duck to water, and Old Testament ideology was like dry and awful for me. Now that the film is done, and now that I'm taking a step back from the internet, uh, I find that that these metaphors from Exodus, I'm using them all the time. <laughs> like they're really, you know, again, like the thing with images. I mean, I am, you know, an artist, an image creator, and yet I am not drawing. I'm not making animation right now. I'm just writing, writing, writing. And I'm thinking like images are scary, powerful, right? Mm. Like the, when you go online, you just see these feeds of photographs and animated GIFs and it's constant images and, Mm. and we're like, we're kind of helpless in the face of all these images. They're really shaping us and we don't really know what they're doing. So, uh, Mm. there's, (laughs) there's that, you know, the whole thing with like false idols, the false self. Because the self, if you want to get philosophical, right, um, the true self is as knowable as the true God, right? Like when people say like, and this is something that they say in trans groups. And by the way, I think 
I think mo- what trans modern trans movement has become is a religion. And that's not actually bad. It's not necessarily bad. People need religions. Mm-hmm. Uh, even when but what, what, what's that, the content of the religion? What's the, the article of faith or the form of it? Well, you have a, you have an ineffable soul that only you can know, which as a gender identity. Okay. And, huh. and that soul is more real than this, uh, you know, know, petty material world that should really just go away. It's sort of irrelevant compared to that. And, um, Faith is the most important thing. You you really need faith, and also hmm. uh, you need you need to punish um, uh, what are they called? Apostates, infidels. Infidels. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that that somebody not believing this thing is a direct threat on you, mm-hmm. whereas you know in reality, no. It's just it's like I'm like happy for you to have your religion. Yeah, um, the, the whole still, rhetoric about erasing their existence comes to mind. Like, yeah. how could how could a different view erase your existence, unless your existence is based purely on your own view of things, which right. is a pretty weak position. Right. It's called narcissistic rage, but I'm also willing to call it a religion. And actually, I think um, protections for trans people could actually be based on laws that we have that protect people's religion. So it's like a religious expression and fine. It's like you, hmm. you are totally entitled to believe what you want and say what you want about yourself and uh, dress as you want, express as you want. All that should be, should totally be protected. It doesn't make sense to try to protect it as sex because it's not sex and hmm. it, it really confuses sex when you add gender identity in there, because gender identity and sex are not the same things at all. You have a sex regardless of your gender identity. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, it's like, it's like regardless of my identity, um, people knew when I was young, well, they still do. I mean, they know that I'm, men know, can, can gauge my strength, right? You can look at my body and gauge my strength. Uh, also, you know, when people are determining who a suitable target is for rape, uh, usually it is people of my sex hmm. that are that are determined to be the suitable target. Yeah. Um, and you know, things like you know, when I when I was younger, it's like yes, I could get pregnant. That's like a very real, uh, constantly in the consciousness issue when you're female that does not go away. Uh, how have I? gone off track here. Uh, right, right. So gender identity has nothing to do with those things. It really doesn't. It's like my gender identity could be anything, uh, but that does not change the physical reality of my body and those issues that I face. So, so putting gender identity in with sex hmm. is a, is a huge problem legally. Okay. Because it means that then you don't have like uh, domestic violence shelters for women anymore. Yeah. And it means that you don't have women's prisons anymore. And the bio, like you said, the biological, biological reality remains. But anyway, religious freedom, it would work for, for, cultural for that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, up to the point where you demand that your doctor give you a pap smear if you don't have a front hole, to use the proper term now. <laughs> The technical term. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nina, thanks. I, I need to r- run, but thank you for your time. And uh, I'll put this out there and, and hopefully you can garner more support. Where can people contact you or watch your stuff? Is it all collected at a central point? Well, my blog is called ninapaley.com. Okay. So you can go there. Uh, Seder masochism has a website, satermasochism.com. My first film, Sita Sings the Blues, has sitasingstheblues.com. My films are all at archive.org. Oh. Because uh, I free them. We haven't even gotten into free culture, but, uh, yeah, I, I free all my work. Um, and that's been good? Oh, yeah, it was great. It was great 
because the internet was so great <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> We're no now, longer in the golden age. Now, now I'm not so sure. Huh. I mean, it's certainly, I'm certainly never going to go back to, to not frame my work. It's just mm. the internet's not functioning the way it did hmm. 10 years ago when I freed Sita Sings the Blues. I mean, that there just weren't these mobs uh, back then yeah. the same way. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the saddest things about this mob stuff is it really, it's a, it's a kind of threat to free culture or all culture uh, that wasn't there hmm. before. So, like I've seen. Sorry, I know you want to end this, but um, yeah. I, you know, my work spreads uh, person to person. So I've seen on Twitter when my when I released my film, somebody tweeted. Oh my gosh, I just saw Sayer Masochism. What a great film. Why didn't I know about this? Immediately they get a response. Nina Paley's a turf and a bigot. She hates trans people. Uh, and then the first person says, Oh gee, I didn't know. Whoops, sorry. Yeah. And that's it. Like yeah. instead of branching and spreading, yeah. it gets shut down. No, they're doing that a lot. They they're going after I mean the big companies are well, the the leftist activists are now empowering the big companies to start to target the more radical on the right but they're getting a little less radical a little less radical a little less radical it's just i don't see it ending well for anybody they're they're killing that which the internet is which is a network a net they're killing the net part of it mm -hmm. uh, and and they're also, not just I... doing it they just figure out where you're weak you had that one wrong view and then you're too toxic to touch oh yeah the people in this town because i did an interview with jordan peterson oh yeah, yeah. now i'm a right-wing nazi and it's like well jordan peterson actually isn't a right-wing nazi i know he has fans who are right-wing nazis but jordan peterson himself is not and also yeah. i'm capable of talking to people that i don't march in lockstep with wait they don't erase your existence those who disagree with correct you? Hmm. And and I feel like this shouldn't need saying, but I'm not right wing. I'm not a right wing white supremacist. <laughs> you don't sound. You don't come across as right wing at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm willing to talk to people who, yeah. you know, either are right wing or have fans that maybe are right wing, or let's just say who who are not orthodox left wing at the moment, which seems to be enough. Like if you fall out of the orthodoxy, yeah, then. Yeah, then it's over for you. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that they don't, you know, the stupid me, I don't totally agree with it, but there's a pattern of behavior where you can say that the left is eating its own, but it's trying to take out everybody else on its <laughs> feeding frenzy. That's what it's actually doing. So it's not just okay to say, well, they're going to deal with it themselves because they go, the piranhas leap out of the pond all the time. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't identify as a liberal anymore. Hmm. That's for sure. I I mean, I'm trying not to identify as anything, right? But, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, right? You're taking a break from identification. Yeah, well, hopefully... Except I'll... when you're buying your whiskey. I don't buy whiskey, so I'm off the hook. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, I, I do say I'm politically homeless at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, welcome to Tent City. Thank may, you. May it not get burned down anytime soon, but I don't know, the fire code's out here pretty substandard <laughs> all right well thank you all right nina thanks a lot you have a good night and i'll let you know when thanks, this is you up. Too. all right all right bye